Welcome to Accessible Art History, the podcast, the best place for art history lovers or anyone that is curious. My name is Annalisa, and I'm going to be sharing an amazing Metropolitan Masterpiece with you today. Just a quick reminder before the episode starts, all sources and images will be posted on the Accessible Art History blog. You can find the link in the episode description, as well as on Instagram at accessible.art.history and at metropolitan.masterpieces. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get started. While walking through the halls of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, today's masterpiece truly catches the viewer's eye. The physical anguish, gruesome expression, and large size are simply hard to miss. Jean-Baptiste Capot's sculpture, Ugolino and His Sons, is a testament to not only his creativity and prowess, but to the power of art throughout history. So to learn more, keep on listening. Standing at an impressive six and a half feet or two meters tall, Ugolino and His Sons is a masterpiece of emotion. The main figure, Count Ugolino della Gerdesca, is hunched over in worry. He anxiously gnaws on his fingers as his son and grandsons wrap themselves around him, perhaps looking for comfort. They are in different stages of anguish from starvation, with one of the youngest boys already dead. He, heartbreakingly, is the only peaceful figure in the sculpture group. One of the most striking parts of this work is the musculature of the figures. Each one looks like they lift weights for a living, and Capot took care to sculpt all of the muscle groups in exquisite detail. There is a specific reason for this, but I'll discuss that later in the episode. Count Ugolino's eyes are especially haunting. They are deep set and he looks up and out at the viewer. At once, they are met with confusion, heartache, and anguish. It's incredibly haunting and powerful. In order to understand the sculpture, I think it's important that we understand the story of Count Ugolino. Born around 1214, Ugolino del Gerardesca, also known as the Count of Dorantico, was an Italian nobleman. During this period, Italy was not a unified country. Instead, it was split into various city-states. These states were aligned with two political parties that were constantly at odds with each other, the Ghibellines and the Guelphs. These two parties were divided on who they thought should rule the Italian peninsula. The Ghibellines decided with the Holy Roman Emperor and his rule of Italy, while the Guelphs sided with the Pope, who supported the idea of self-governing city-states. There were smaller regional conflicts between these two factions as well. The Count was born in Pisa, and his ancestors included German nobility. This connected them with the Holy Roman Empire and made them leaders in the Ghibellines in the city. When Ugolino came of age, he became the party's leader in Pisa. However, in 1271, he married a sister of Giovanni Visconti, a judge of Gallura. The Visconti family were wealth leaders in Pisa. This made his fellow Ghibelline party members suspicious of his intentions. In 1274, Ugolino and his brother-in-law, Giovanni Visconti, were arrested for plotting to overthrow the Pisan government with the Guelphs and take the power for themselves. Not long after, Visconti died in exile, and Ugolino was replaced from prison and exiled as well. Clearly, though, he was still power-hungry. He contacted Guelph governments in Florence and Lucca, and met with Charles I of Anjou, and their combined armies invaded Pisa. Their forces won, and Ugolino was put into power as a member of the Guelph party. Treachery and war followed him for the rest of his life. On July 1st, 1288, after leaving a council meeting, Ugolino and his followers were attacked by a band of armed Ghibellines. The archbishop of the city charged him with treason and treachery. After the town hall was set on fire, Ugolino surrendered. He, his sons, and grandsons were detained in the tower on the orders of the archbishop who had claimed power for himself. The key was literally thrown away, and the prisoners were left to starve to death. Today, Count Ugolino is especially remembered due to his inclusion in Dante's Inferno. The author placed him in the ice of the second ring, Antonora, or the lowest circle of Inferno. This was reserved for betrayers of kin, country, guests, and benefactors. He is trapped next to the archbishop that ordered his death by starvation and constantly gnaws on his skull. Dante wrote, I saw two shades frozen in a single hole, packed so close, one head hooded the other, the way the starving devour their bread, the soul had a clenched the other with his teeth, where the brain meets the nape. Dante also writes that Ugolino's children begged him to eat their flesh after they died, so that he could live but a little longer. Father, our pain, they said, will lessen if you eat us, are the one who clothed us with this wretched flesh, we plead for you to be the one who stripped it away. Ugolino then tells the reader that his hunger was stronger than grief, giving him the nickname the Cannibal Count. And I, already going blind, groped over my brood, calling to them though I had watched them die for two long days, and then the hunger had more power than even sorrow over me. Now that we've heard the story of Count Ugolino, we can understand why the artist chose to show his figures in such anguish. However, it's important to note that Carpo had another significant source of inspiration. It comes in the form of the famous Hellenic-era Greek sculpture, titled Laocoon and His Son. This ancient sculpture group shows the moment when the Trojan priest and his sons were attacked and killed by sea snakes. 
in retaliation for speaking up against the Greeks bearing gifts in the Trojan War. This work stands at an impressive six foot seven inches tall and is the model of human anguish. Laocoon wretches as his sons are killed and the sea snakes envelop their bodies, yet somehow they are still breathtakingly beautiful. Their muscles ripple with strength and fear. Their togas, which have been cast aside to showcase their naked beauty, drape beautifully. The viewer almost forgets that the cloth is in fact made of stone. During Carpeau's lifetime, and even now in ours, the Laocoon sculpture group is in the collection of the Vatican Museum. Artists spent time in Rome, which we'll dive more into later, and most certainly encountered this piece and was inspired by its use of emotion. Additionally, Carpeau was inspired by the work of Michelangelo within Rome. He was especially drawn to the magnificent Last Judgment scene that the artist painted in the Sistine Chapel in the 16th century. The viewer can see Carpeau's admiration in the careful rendering of the musculature. Michelangelo was skilled in anatomical realism, and Carpeau sought to emulate that in his own works. Next, we're going to just go more in depth about the artist himself. But first, let's take a quick break. Have you thought about making your own history podcast? Well, I use Spotify for podcasters, and it couldn't be easier. Spotify has a platform that allows you to make one easily, distribute it, and even earn money. All in one place, and it's totally free, which is great for independent podcasters like myself. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Personally, I use my laptop and an Amazon microphone, and it's really easy. Then all you have to do is click and you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else that podcasts are heard so your audience can reach you no matter where you are. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. And when you want to take conversations with your fans to the next level, you can use Q&A and polls. With Spotify for podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, it makes it easy for me to share my love of art history with my audience every week for Accessible Art History, the podcast. I highly recommend you give it a try if you're interested in bringing your love of history to the community. Download Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Hi there, this is Annalisa, the founder of Accessible Art History. Thanks for tuning in today. As a part of my mission, I work to provide free quality art history content for anyone who is curious. But if you'd like to support Accessible Art History, you can find the link to my Patreon for monthly support or buy me a coffee for a one-time donation. If you do decide to donate, please let me know so that I can give you a shout out on a future episode. Thank you for listening and let's get back to our episode. All right, now that we're back, let's talk about the life of Jean-Baptiste Carpeau. He was born on May 11, 1827. His father was a stonemason, so he would have been exposed to sculptural concepts early in life. Carpeau entered the École des Beaux-Arts in 1844 in order to learn the foundational elements of being an artist. Ten years later, in 1854, Carpeau's work earned him the Prix de Rome Prize. This scholarship, which had been developed by Louis XIV, gave artists the opportunity to study and live in Rome for three to five years at the expense of the state. Carpeau stayed in the Eternal City for the full five years, studying the works of Michelangelo, Donatello, and Verrocchio. In a break with conventional French sculptural tradition, the artist sought to bring emotion and realism to his subjects. After returning to France for a few years, Carpeau found himself tiring of the academic style in his home country, so he returned to Rome. He wrote down his reasoning for returning, saying, quote, When an artist feels pale and cold, he runs to Michelangelo in order to warm himself, as with the rays of the sun. Reinvigorated by his trip to Rome, Carpeau returned to France. He quickly found favor in the court of Napoleon III. In 1866, he established his own studio in order to reproduce and make work on a larger scale. That same year, Carpeau was made a Chevalier of the Legion of Honor. Jean-Baptiste Carpeau died on October 12, 1875. His works are in some of the biggest museums in the world, inspiring admirers over generations. While Carpeau was living and working in Rome, he stayed at and was associated with the French Academy. Since 1804, the Academy has been housed in the Villa Medici, located within the Villa Borghese on the Pinician Hill. This group has a rich history. It was founded in 1666 on the orders of King Louis XIV and was put under the direction of Jean-Baptiste Colbert, Charles Lebrun, and Gian Lorenzo Bernini, some of the busiest artistic names in the age. 
The Prix de Rome contest, which Carpeau won in 1866, was interrupted in World War I due to Mussolini's influence. In fact, at that point, the Academy was forced to give up their space in the Villa Medici and flee to Nice. The competition and the Prix de Rome were eliminated in 1868, but the villa is still under control of the French government. Today, it's a historical attraction in Rome and is open to the public for tours. Today, the sculpture of Ugolino and his sons is located in Gallery 548 of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, also known as the Carroll and Milton Petrie European Sculpture Court. The roof is made of glass, allowing sunlight to filter in and highlight the brilliance of the marble. This also serves to show visitors how light plays across sculpture and changes our perception of it with shadow. Works from the European tradition and span 200 years between 1700 and 1900 make up the contents of this gallery. The sculpture of Ugolino and his sons is a testament to human anguish. Although it's hard to sympathize with the real-life Italian count, we can't help but to be drawn in by the beauty, pain, and anatomic accuracy. Well, that's a wrap on this week's episode. The next one will be released in a couple of weeks because I'm going on vacation and going to take a break from work while I'm in Disney World. See you all then. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at accessible.art.history and at metropolitan.masterpieces for updates and to keep an eye out for the next episode. They drop every week on your favorite podcast platform. If you prefer to listen on YouTube, you can find episodes there on well, about two weeks after each episode is posted. Cheers and see you for the next episode.